Hello everyone, I'm Joanna Fabicon, Senior Librarian of Children's Services in the Youth Services Department of Los Angeles Public Library. Welcome to today's LA May program, Fenekite Restaurant and the Art of Menu Creation. First, we'd like to thank the National Endowment for the Humanities, our Library Foundation, and our amazing behind the scenes staff for helping bring LA Made programs to you virtually. LA Made focuses on the diverse landscape of Los Angeles, highlighting the immense artistic and performance talent that has developed in the course of the city's eclectic history. If you would like to see more of our amazing programs, please visit our online calendar at lapl.org slash events. And for our LA Made program specifically, visit lapl.org slash LA Made. We should put those links on the comments for you. There they are, um, so that you can click on them and see them right away. Um, our website also has blog posts, video links, and all other kinds of fun things that highlight the library's diverse resources and upcoming programs. Now on to today's program, Fenekite Restaurant and the Art of Menu Creation. Chef Min Fan is a proud Angelino who has been cooking professionally for almost two decades, creating and tinkering her entire life. She currently helms two critically acclaimed modern California restaurants, Fenekite at Second Home Los Angeles and Porridge and Puffs. Bragging moment, I've eaten at Porridge and Puffs so many times and loved it every time. Um, Fenekite though was recently recognized as restaurant of the year by the LA Times. Juxtaposing narrative and ingredients, Chef Min Pham regards menu writing as one of the most important aspects of her job. To quote Chef Fan, the menu is a guide for both diners and our team, but used differently. For the guests, it is to better understand the story and ingredients. For the team, it gives them a matrix to work off of. A thought through menu is one that reflects the season, integrates techniques, expresses values and styles, and ultimately is thoughtful of both the diner and the team. But before we bring up Chef Min, we're going to be showing a short vid video produced by the LA Times with camera work by Cody Long and edited by J.R. Lizarraga. It's been a crazy year! That's where we begin. We often get asked, what kind of cuisine is this? What kind of food is this? And then I said Californian. Angelino, modern Angelino, and then people like, they don't get the answer they want. So they ask me, where are you from? And I said, Los Angeles. No, no, but where are you from? I'm like, oh, I think you, what you want to ask me is I'm Vietnamese. This is not Vietnamese food. My mom cooks amazing Vietnamese food. And the reason I don't call it Vietnamese food is because it would offend a lot of people, especially my mother. Um, because she's like one of the things she's like, no, no, if you don't do it the way I do it, it's not Vietnamese. I like to draw inspiration specifically from Los Angeles, but I think LA has such a rich and diverse community that comes with great food. Our menu is inspired by fire, air, ingredients of LA. Fenekite is truly an homage to LA all the time. The origin story is Nikki Nakayama of Anaka was, you know, having a drink one night and she's like, you know what, I really want to collaborate with men. And then she and Carol just called me up when they were like drinking. And it just happened. And she's like, do you want to collaborate? I'm like, yeah, of course, you're a Naka, duh, and I love you. Why wouldn't I? I'd be stupid. And I think my greatest strength is my team and our purveyors. Season by season, I look at every ingredient differently. You know, I've, I've seen a lot quite a million times. I've used it in savory, I've used it in sweet, I've used it cold, hot, I've crisped it up. I've, you know, so it's like, I think it's really important to use those ingredients, but through my lens, it's a re, you know, it's I'm looking through things differently. On March 16th, um, 
the mayor of LA closed down, stay at home, and then our team, I don't know what was wrong with me, but instead of like breathing and freaking out, I immediately that Sunday while we were planning, I'm like, you know what, let's open back up on Wednesday and let's just give people provisions. And I don't know how we did it, but we did it. We turned it around two days, we met, we came up with a menu, we got packaging. I think we were so ahead of the game before everything shut down. Um, and then it really worked for a long time. I mean, you know, takeout for us really worked. And then the shutdown happened again in November. And that was harder than the first time, I think. Um, the second shutdown was really hard. That's when they're like, you know what, we're so tired. Like, just something. Can you just re be real? And then so I think I was kind of, you know, I relented and I let them rest. And then once outdoor dining happened again, we came back here and we've been doing that since um, Valentine's Day, slowly, very, very slowly, but um, just getting the quirks. Post-pandemic, I really want people to enjoy Fennekite. Um, I just want to give people a lot of joy and I think I'm slowly coming out of the pandemic depression and seeing more clearly. And I really want to jump into the next phase and give people a lot of joy. So the future is Fennekite and who knows what else. Fennekite for celebration and artistic practice. Um, I want people to, a lot of people to have access to it. I want it to be something that has all of the heart and soul um, and our artistry of Fennekite, but be something that you can have all the time. Wow, I was just mesmerized watching that video. Ming, congratulations. It was beautiful and on all the recognition and the accolades so well-deserved. And, and again, thank you. What, what a journey it's been. And now you're here today spending your, your time with us and I thank you for that as well. I'm so excited to hear more. And I just want to address the audience, everyone's watching, anyone who's watching live, if you have any questions as we chat, please feel free to go ahead and type it in the comments section. We'd love to have you be part of this conversation. Um, Min, are you ready to dive in to the art of menu creation? <laughs> um, let's Let go ahead. Hint. There we there go. There you are. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Joanna. Oh my goodness. Um, so good to see you. I love your very, very um, NPR voice. It's very soothing and um, so nice to hear. Let's dive right in. Yeah, um, I'll let you. I'll let you lead the way because um, sometimes well, I need a guide. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just thought I'd start with the very top, and and that's the title, right? Similar to books, we have that title. It's the first point of connection to the reader. Um, mm -hmm. It's the first thing that diners see. But that's not necessarily the same case for the creator, right? Like, so I guess I just want to, or, or, or was it? So like, was the title something that you started with and you built the menu from there? Or was it just a general theme? And then this title um, uh, from your summer menu, was it Summer Under the Stars? Just, just mm. came out. Yeah. I, I think it was such a, for the most, I think um, it is a pretty perfunctory title. Mm -hmm. um, more so than anything super creative. Um, just, I think I wanted to communicate that it was outside. Um, so I had to find a way to, to communicate to people when they saw it, when they were, you know, booking reservations that they knew that it was going to be outside and under the stars immediately gave it away that it was outside. It was really important to convey that, um, you know, while we're in the pandemic, um, and then seasons are really important to us. So it kind of, it's, you know, the menu tells you two things. It's going to be outside and it's going to be a summer menu. So um, I think that's in, that's about as much inf information that you would need to make reservations and to kind of open it up um, to ever, anything else underneath that. Um, so it, we left it pretty ambiguous after that. No, I do love that. That's just both artistic and efficient yeah. at the same time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, well, let's see. So let's go ahead like, in terms of menu and creating the story. Um, maybe we should go 
in order. So first page, first item. Um, there we go. Okay. Um, yeah. I'm going to try to pronounce this correctly. Um, mm -hmm. Why is the first item Black Sesame Vichyssoise? Yeah, you know what? I'm going to take a step back oh, and okay. talk about and talk instead of talking about the whole menu and sure. i think it's more about the process because the menu is like almost like you're writing all these drafts i think like unlike writing a screenplay or a novel i think it's writing a menus it's like a little different you know like some people just free write and then they go back and edit and i think that the menu it's a lot more thinking 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 and but by, by the time you write it's the manifestation of like almost the, what you're going to be delivering. So there's not, there's still a lot of editing, but it's different than, you know, you just free writing because there's a lot of thinking that goes behind how a menu comes to be like, like for certain things, like um, the way I usually start a menu, um, let's say I have a blank slate is I go to the farmer's market. I think about what's in season. I think about the techniques I've been working on. I think about where my team is at. I think about um, what's happening. What what am I being inspired right then topically? Um, what's happening in the news? What's um, the zeitgeist? Um, you know, and sometimes that's why a lot of menus are zeitgeisty because there's things that we are influenced by. Um, like right now, like when we wrote the summer menu, we thought a lot about California wildfires. We thought a lot about um, the indigenous land that we're on. Um, so those are things that there's more than just what's the, the food, but the story that we want to talk about and we want to bring to the forefront via our menu. Um, so those things happen before we actually put a menu together. And then when we think about putting a menu together, um, it's like if someone's hosting a party, they think about who their guests or if they're, if it's a reader, who their audience is. And that's super duper important. Um, in, in addition to, you know, making sure we check all these other creative boxes or you're not, we don't even check boxes, but to deliver creative ideas and taking care of our team and making sure it a lot, everything aligns. We also want to make sure we really take into consideration the audience, our guests. And for us, um, by taking into consideration who they are, um, we want to make sure that they leave, like what's the, you know, what do we want them to leave with? And that's something that we rev revisit, revisit every time we write a menu. Um, there's some basic, not basic, but there's some core values that we hold as Fenekite um, that we always make sure that is incorporated. We make sure the things that we always make sure that are incorporated is, are our values. Um, our values being um, thoughtfulness with the guests, um, expressing our care and love for the environment, our care and love for the, our growers and producers, um, our care and love for, it's a lot of gratitude. Mm -hmm. um, so the, our care and love for our team members, but it, it also expresses things that we care about and things that we wanna talk about. Um, most of those things being California, being a Californian and Angelina restaurant. Um, we, you know, we talk about immigration. We talk, we talk about indigenous land. We talk about stewarding the land. We talk about California wildfires. We talk about other restaurants in our community. We talk about staples and why that's important. We talk, you know, so there's a lot these things that we all bring into a menu that we think a lot about and it gets edited down to like, if we, cause we have a thousand ideas, but how do we bring it all together and focus it so it makes sense to the guest. And ultimately they don't have to come in for a lesson. They're coming in to dine and to enjoy themselves and to walk away feeling loved and cared for. Um, they're not there to learn any kind of history lesson or, you know, topical lesson or my point of view in politics, but we hope that a little bit of that gets incorporated via us really caring for our guests and therefore we're sharing things that we feel are really important. Um, and in that sense, we, the way we place the menu is we tend to do things that are a little, we think about people's psychology and how they read um, and how they absorb information. We tend to have more experimental 
stuff at the beginning when they're coming in fresh and they're opening their eyes, but not too much because it's so overwhelming to walk in a new space. We also want to make sure they feel loved and cared for right away. Um, and then, you know, we kind of hit them with one or two stories, but, you know, we kind of let them settle and then we hit them with a few more stories. But at the end, we tend to hit them with more loving, caring stories at the end. A lot of times when you go to a fine dining restaurant or tasting menu, people can leave very unsatisfied, even though the food is really cerebral and the stories are really good because the food doesn't satiate your soul um, and the food doesn't really connect. And for us, for me, with my menu, I really want to make a connection with people. So I always end the menu with things that are very connecting and very loving. And I just want to bring the point home that we experiment with a few things. Thank you for going on this journey with us. But I'm going to end this on a note that says, hey, I'm looking at you. I'm giving you a hug via my food. And then we usually give them like one last kiss, something to like surprise them and leave them delighted and wondering what was that and how do they come back for more? So that's like, that's the storytelling, right? It's like you kind of hit these points and these notes and it doesn't always work out. It takes a lot of tweaking and tinkering. And, you know, like you might come in during a time when we're still transitioning something or figuring something out. And, you know, I'm pretty honest about it. I'm like, yeah, we just tried that. You know, we love the taste of that. But, you know, the seasons are still changing. It's not quite peak season. You know, that's why we had to, you know, we had to tweak the flavors a little bit. And we had to do this and that. But we're very transparent about it. But there's times when we, there's a dish and we just hit it because it's the perfect timing. Everything's right. You know, the story's right. The, the people, you know, we deliver it properly. And those are things that we think about um, a lot. And when we, and when we ever, whenever we get lost during service, we're so glad we have this guide, right? That we pre-wrote this guide that we want to return back to. And it's also a guide for guests to know what's coming up, but it's also a reminder for them that, this is a part of a bigger story. Um, and it also helps them remind them of ingredients that they may not have heard of um, or remind them of ingredients that they have heard of but haven't seen in a while. Wow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing. That is just the the template of, of everything. I've, I have so many questions for that. But um, I don't know. I guess, like, even from this first part of the menu, um, we see that already. We have not just, I mean, you said you don't want necessarily, they're not getting, people dining there aren't necessarily getting a, a lesson, but here we have stories from the get-go. Um, the three, just that box, Three Sisters and the Sea, you already, this is your, this is like comforting. Um, I don't know. Like, can, tell me, can you tell me the, the story of the three sisters in the sea? How that sure. Came <laughs> and we'll, you know, we'll, I'm going to jump back to the black sesame vichy sauce. So that's like something oh, yes. that, like, people are going to be like, what is that? Why is that? And then it's basically they, not everyone will know exactly what to expect from it. And that's what we want them to place exactly where we want them to be. We, them, we want them to be, okay, you know what? I need to take off all, you know, put down all my guards, be open to this because I don't know what to expect. And that's kind of intentionally the first course. It's something where you're like, I don't, I've never heard of this. I've never heard of juxtapose. I don't even know if I can pronounce this word. And then we, it's something that can seem like a fine dining intimidation. But for us, we break it down right away. We're like, you know what? We can prescribe all we want, how to eat this and what to do with this. Mm -hmm. But the only prescription we have is have fun because we don't, we don't really know how to eat it either. We just eat it because you just eat it. Because I think with fine dining, there's always this prescription, do this, do that. This is what the chef thought. I'm like, it doesn't matter. I just want you to have fun with this. I want you to taste every bite differently. Um, don't mix it all together. Have, you know, build the bites. Um, Cause this is the intention of this. And we put in every single different kind of texture and flavor we can think of. And it's a vegan dish. You know, so it's the, these things that, you know, things that we care about, but it's very quiet in the way it's done. It's done. It's done with the thoughtfulness of the guests in mind, but it still shows off a few of our techniques. These things that aren't really done anywhere else. Like we do this beautiful coral that we know that, you know, is unique to us. We ferment things that usually are not 
people don't even know exists, like green figs, um, you know, or Buddha's hands or lemon verbena oil, like things that, you know, you don't put all these things together. So we know that it's going to just kind of like set, set the bar of like, okay, put all your expectations away, want to do something new. And then the next course, we jump into something right into our values. This is what we believe in. This is the seasons. This is how we talk about the seasons, like the three sisters. The three sisters um, is a story that if you're a Californian is told and repeated, um, you know, it's an indigenous way of growing companion growing, um, in mostly Mesoamerican areas and, you know, Calif the Californias and the three sisters is of course, corn, bean, and squash. Um, corn is grown then it, you know, corn is a very, you know, indigenous, it's indigenous and endemic to the area we live in. Um, corn grows up and the beans grow around it. And the squash also does as well. And the squash provides really big leaves to shade everything, to shade the pl other plants um, so they don't from the sun. And then finally, the beans grow and then the, and then the beans fall to the ground and they bring nitrogen to the soil, um, which is really in the, and the nitrogen regenerates the soil. And then the process starts again. Um, and it's a type of so it brings for us it's like okay you know what everything we do is going to be in harmony it's going to be thoughtful of the land um and we talk about in this same segment we talk about the thoughtfulness of the sea which has been done for a really long time and how is it done we talk a little bit about that but we you know we kind of mirror each guest some guests really just want to dig in and then the, again we give them this plate that's like where do i start it's like a a little bit of a treasure hunt because you have all these elements on there. I wish I had brought some photos. I'm sorry I didn't. But there's all these little treasures that we want them to find and discover. And again, you know, if you were anywhere else, you know, a lot of fine dining place would be like, eat this first, eat with your left hand, you know, clap two <laughs> times and then, you know, poke it with your right hand. But with the can, headphones on, listen yeah, to me, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and it's like, you know, and that's great too. And we, you know, we have a little, you know, a little bit of that you know, like these are fun experiences, but for the most part, we tell people like, you know, what, where does your eyes want to go? But we also think about where natural eyes want to go, how we read from the left to the right, how we read the center, you know, so we kind of have some of that psychology when we plate, but we really naturally let the guests figure out what speaks to them. You know, and there's like fried stuff and there's steamed stuff and there's different colors. And so it's like each person's going to gravitate towards a different thing. And that's okay, you know, and it's like, and that's because we at the end, we know that it's all going to come together. We do give them a few things that help bring it together. Like we say, if you ever need to dip anything, if anything is not seasoned to your liking, because everyone does have a palate, we try to season to the best, you know, but it is our seasoning. So if you think anything needs a little bit more, a little less, if you need a little bit more seasoning, we have a remoulade that you can just dip right in there and it'll give you a nice grounding and a little bit of herbiness. If anything feels too rich, um, there are some fried foods on here. We do have some beautiful handmade pickles. We have, you know, watermelon, passion fruit, rind pickles, pickled aliens. Um, and then we had like purple moss. We also have a, we always have a bunch of pickled stuff. And that's one of our signature things that we do is we ferment and pickle um, and use all parts of a plant and an animal an animal so we include that on plates sometimes are hidden sometimes are called out but we if you ever need a palette reset go here if you ever don't know where to go try here so we do give them a little bit of a guide um can you imagine having a dinner and having everyone tell you all this it's um it's pretty <laughs> it's 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 pretty daunting right but it's but we these are things we've thought about a lot and then our team looks at the plate our team eats it you know so like we we plate and we it's composition it's storytelling right like wherever your diction is really important where you place that period in that comma it's very important. If you're going to curse, you have to, it has to be efficient. So writing a menu is the same way. Why did you do it? Why did we put a box? You know, why did we, you know, why didn't we write a paragraph? We wanted to stand out. There's certain things, you know, why are things italicized? Same thing. You know, why are things capitalized? Why are things, you know, in bold? It's all for communication. And it's all because with language and with writing, we're using it to communicate. Um, and that's just, and this is just the first 10 minutes of the meal. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can see 
interesting that like everything that you talked about, like we mentioned in um, in the introduction, um, how the menu was a matrix for your team and, and that is apparent. Um, I just look at this again for that first part of the meal and from here coming from as as a diner and also a reader, like th there's imagery just in this first section already. Like you have the stories and the guidebook and um, the way that you talked about it really kind of emphasize it that this is an adventure. It's an elevated experience, but it's also accessible one. And it could be, I don't know, cater to whatever, however you want to take it. Um, and you have the menu as your guide and you have your team as your guide too. And yeah. that's, and that's the accessibility is really important to me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think I, you know, and it's like a, it's a word and I think, you know, the LA Times video, there, there are some words missing that were like edited and um, accessible is something I think about a lot. Because like when you're in fine dining, <clears throat> you have to remember, um, we know, I feel like, and this is a funny conversation, but I feel like we don't charge enough to pay our team properly. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a constant battle. But at the same time, like how much, it's hard to value art. It's hard to put a value on it. And, you know, we're trying to like, here we are trying to give this ephemeral art, you know, that's going to, you just can, you know, you experience it and then it's gone. You don't take it with you. So, but how do you price that? You know, because at the end of the day, some people are just going to see this food. They're just going to see this fuel and efficiency and food. And they're like, you know, like they're like a shrimp is a shrimp is a shrimp. Right. But it's not right. And so. And no, it's, it's wild shrimp tempura. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, like, and you know, and how, what was done to it, and how was it, you know, and how did the team, you know, how hard did the team work on it? But at the same time, it's really important to me that we do have some, you know, both figuratively as well as literally. I do access is important to me because I think the the work I do, I really try to be as inclusive as possible. But, you know, but it's also kind of, it's sometimes I feel pretty hypocritical about it because, you know, our team sometimes can't afford it, wouldn't be able to afford mm. at our own place. Um, but those are things that we are working on that we're constantly working on, on. But that's why we have other avenues and having other avenues and connecting the community is really important to me. But in terms of the word access, in terms of the actual experience, once you're there, it's really important for us and our team to meet our guests where they want to be. And I always tell our team is love, you know, love and care for people the way they want to be loved and cared for, not the way we want to be loved and cared for. A lot of times chefs want to care for people in the way that they want to be cared for, you know, in a very egotistical showing off like this is what I can do I want to impress you way look at my knife skills yeah. <laughs> yeah and that's not what I, you know I can do all that but that's for me for the guests is like where do you why are they here are they here celebrating are they here making up after a fight are they here you know just because they're curious like there's so many reasons a guest comes in and I think for us, it's really important to not have, like, and not to be about us, 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 perform, perform, dance for them. Number one, you know, we're not, you know, we're not a hire to dance kind of a company. Mm -hmm. And we're not those kind of performance artists. Number two, we're not really, our cooking is not really a monologue. It's a dialogue at the very least. You know, we have, it's going back and forth. It's like, how do the guests feel? How do we feel? How does the room feel? Um, it's like, you know, a much more collaborative, not only like the collaborative in the sense of our work and our team's work, but collaborative with the guests and our community. How does it all connect back? Where do we make the connections? Um, and I think that's where we insert accessibility. We find access points across our menu. Sometimes we want to challenge people, but other times we're like, you know what? You're going to love this. That's all you need to know. Oh, well, let's move on to the second part of the yeah. menu and like, like we'll see some more examples of that. Um, I have to, so this is pretty straightforward. Blue Lake Beans, but although burnt fig leaf mochi, what is, please tell yeah. me the story of so, that. But, um, so, yeah, so we're in the middle of the menu now. What, right, so what Blue Lake Beans is pretty straightforward. Yeah. We always have a super seasonal mm -hmm. dish um, that brings the seasons together and it's really bright and you know bright and lively and peak of season 
Um, and it's always a dish that you read that seems like, oh, the throwaway dish. But we always remember that it's make it read like a throwaway dish. But when you have it, you're like, whoa, those are the best beans I've ever had. Those are the best, you know, like the way we put it together is really special. So we always, you know, there's things, certain expectation, and they're like, okay, nothing's going to happen now. I just had this big thing, and then now I don't need to learn anything. Now I can have a little break. And it is a little break, you know, but when you taste it, you're like, I know these feelings. This is so bright. You know, I'm, I'm awake again. It's going to give me second wind. And then we go into this next course, the burnt fig leaf and the hinoki smoke. So this is um, kind of become, um, it's a dish that I bring out myself. Um, the team brings it out. And then I, I burn it in front of people and I talk about it. And we talk a lot about this dish because this dish is so, it's one of an example of how I come to the table and tell a story. So the, the, the story of this dish, of these two dishes, it comes on a tile, um, a fireproof tile. Um, we had to test a lot of things that can stand very high heat, um, immediate high heat and in front of people and had had to be safe. We had to figure a way to do it safely. It is a little dramatic, um, but our goal was not for it to be as dramatic as it is. It just so happens to be dramatic. Yeah, but, a little drama never hurt anyone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the way we talk about the story, it's, it's this, these two dishes is our homage to California wildfires. Mm -hmm. California wildfires is something that Californians think about a lot, but have had, have been taught the only way we can control wildfires is Smokey the Bear telling us to not blow anything up and not, you know, and to prevent fires and to repress fire. However, indigenous ways and old cultural ways and just because we are who we are and looking at alternative ways is to have small controlled burns. So in honor of that, we have a small controlled burn for each guest in front of them. Um, we burn fig leaves and hinoki, which is cypress, really thin cut cypress. And underneath the fig leaf is a mochi. And it's really, and this dish came about because you and I have looked, seen a lot of wildfires as Californians. And I look at it across the way, you know, when we're on the freeway or wherever you're standing, you just, you see it from afar. And on fire days, it is, you can smell the smoke, you can see the ashes, but the sky is always so beautiful. Have you, like, that's always like bright orange or pinks. And there's always like this beauty that comes from this destruction. So I think of, about that a lot. I think about the holistic cycle of life. And that's why we, we have a mochi. Mochi, um, I'm Vietnamese and mochi is for, you know, Asian culture is it's in the shape of the sun. It's made of rice. And we talk about, you know, the rice coming from Robin Coda. It's made from sweet rice and rice is life for us, but the shape of the sun is also life, a life energy for us. But the reason it's the mochi is so representative for us is because you will see the mochi on death altars when you go to funerals. You'll also see it at birth parties and you'll also see it New Year because the mochi, which is round, doesn't see a beginning to end of the life cycle. And it equally celebrates death and life. And fire does us a lot of the same. It's like it's the death of one thing but the rebirth and the regeneration of another thing. So it is part of our COVID story. It's like, you know, one thing may die, but there's always hope and optimism that comes from it. And this, this dish embodies all of this. And then you get this smell and you get this scent and you get this touch. We have people touch, smell. We, we have a lot of things, unlike other places, our menu has a lot of things that we put in there very quietly that you can touch. And, you know, we, you know, we tell people, touch this, eat it, you know, we're not going to tell you how to eat it, but there's things, touch it, you know, like get all your senses working. So you see it, you smell it, you know, it's smoke, you smell it, you taste it. There's different textures. Um, we play around with textures a lot. Um, and then you hear it because with fire, it's the sound and the crisp. And then ultimately you feel it. And, you know, and you feel it with like every single ounce of energy you have. And for us, that's really important because all your senses are activated. And this dish really, if there's any dish that hasn't done that for you up until this point, we really drive it home with this dish. 
and then we blow it up and then we are left with this beautiful presentation. Um, and so it's such a, you know, it's kind of like this, you know, very, the high point. And then from there on, we tend to make things a little bit more comfortable. We're like, okay, this is all, these are all the lessons we have. And then moving forward, it's just about us taking care of the environment and taking care of you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being grateful. I think that would be admit you have like a little dinner and a show. Um, but what a special experience. That's so lovely to be able to, you know, hear that story straight from you and to experience and then and then eat it right afterwards. <laughs> Wonderful. All right, I can already I can already visualize it right now. Um, so let's see. All right, should we move on to actually one of my favorite parts? Um, reading that there's an intermezzo. Yeah. On this menu, and it's a dance party. Yeah, because, you know, you've had to learn all these lessons, and you're like, wow, is it just going to be this depressing? And we're like, well, COVID is pretty depressing. <laughs> so let's have, you know, a mezzo, an intermezzo, um, mm -hmm. an interlude. Um, and it's just pretty much like um, intermission, intermezzo, same as intermission. It's taking a little break from what's been going on. So we take a break from all this, like, ah, and then it's just like, you know what? It's one little dish. Um, we It's a place for us to experiment with, again, with textures, flavors, seasonality. Um, usually we have this one bite and um, it's actually three bites, but there's so many different things in it. It's like there's fermented stuff, fresh fruit, um, fermented fruit, pickled fruit, sugared fruit, you know, and savory. It's a savory dish. We finish it with like all the fun techniques that, you know, a gastron, you know, we foam stuff up, we gel stuff up. It's like all the things that you would think of that, that we don't tell anyone any of this. We just like, here, just have it. Because it's like, I'm a real big fan of, you know what, people show off all day, all day long on TV and like, look at this. And we did this. And for me, I'm like, you know what, it should just taste good too. And so for our kitchen and for our team, it's all this fun technique and all these things we're experimenting with. But by the time we get the guests get it, we don't even tell them what it is. We're like, just have it. It's safe. It's fun. Um, so it's also our way of using scraps. We use scraps a lot. Um, and it's really important for us to use all parts of um, all parts of any ingredient we use so it's a, our way of throwing in scraps in there because you know our team like certain dishes require really um fine cuts and really precise cuts in order for us to present it a certain way and then there'll be like scraps left over um fine dining place in the past have just thrown that out um for us we really relish those scraps and it's really important and then people are like oh that's really smart you know they're so economical it is a very expensive way to do something, to be honest with you, because I think sometimes people don't think that it is much more, we do it because we really, it's what we value. It's we value human craft and we value the environment and we value not having waste, but it's not cheap because taking care of waste takes a lot of time and that is not free. We have to, you know, pay our team. We have to use, take up a lot of time to save those scraps, but it's a value, something it's a, that we stand for. So we do it, but it goes into this, all this love goes into this dance party and you eat it and it's just bright and fun and textures and you're just, and you don't really know what you've eaten. Um, like, you know, we'll throw like gooseberries and fermented plum gelée and like a macroot lime foam. And, you know, it's just like, so you have like, you know, you have like this like soft, crunchy, you know, airy it's like you go through all these like different emotions and textures as you eat this dish so and it's just a dance part in your mouth your mouth is just like whoa what just happened you know and you're just like strobe lights you know break dancing <laughs> well you're saying gonna... you're saying dance part in your mouth but like just the way that you're describing i'm also i'm already thinking like like just and i it's true I mean. <laughs> you eat it and you that's what you want to do after you eat it um, you know, and I hope that, you know, I always tell people, I'm like, this is the, or they tell me, it's like, this is the dish that you're like, whoa, I think I just went to space and back. And I'm like, perfect. That's exactly what we wanted to happen. Amazing. So, yeah. Well, so that's all right. Like Behind the scenes, when you're coming up with this interlude, this intermezzo, like, I mean, it is a dance party. Were there any, was, what music was in, it, was there music behind anyone's mind as they're Ooh. creating, or is there music, um, throughout any of this process? That's a really good question. Um, and it's a very personal question for me because oh, I, um, because I 
you know, I curate all the music um, or I, I put the playlist together, um, you know, at, at our restaurant. And I love doing the music because it is my chance to um, be a 90s music geek and play all the stuff that's it's like still so relevant, you know, but I play the Yolo Tangos. I play the, you know, as much Elliot Smith as, you know, people can stand, um, you know, so it's really, you know, it's a, but I play a lot of like your nineties music, like nineties, like a certain singer songwriter era of music mm -hmm. um, that I love, you know, it's like from my collegiate days, you know, I can play all that music and all those fun um, singer songwriter songs and music and then you know we sprinkle it with a little bit of jazz so for me like I'm not I'm very sensitive to sound I personally listen to, if I listen to music at all it's mostly classical music or I just listen to what I li listen again like in the 90s so um, our music our playlist is mostly stuff that I really love from the 90s like in a good way you know like a lot of um, orchestral pop um, indie pop, like, you know, like all the sub pop records, you know, are in there, you know, like it's like, it's just, um, and so the music for this dish, if there is any music, I think, I think it is an interlude from all that music. And I definitely see the intermezzo being def more, definitely more of a rave. Yeah. Um, unlike the singer songwriter, the intermezzo is definitely a nineties rave. Um, definitely <laughs> blasting some sort of bad techno, but it's okay. Sometimes you need bad techno to wake you up and just to t spend time with friends and get out of your head. That's wonderful. So we have like an underlying playlist going on with the menu and the experience as well. Um, you spoke about this a little bit earlier um, in terms of um, with the guest experiences at the beginning, like you throw out like the new stuff the, the, as the, to get them settled. But I noticed like just the narrative and the flow as this menu goes on, you, um, you do start off with like more concrete descriptions in the previous um, courses, right? Um, you know, you, you have right there fish and then the bird fig mochi and all of these things. But now towards the end, we're heading towards some conceptual stuff, gratitude, cleanse, sweet. Um, can you talk about this transition? Yeah, you know what, the only, um, cause cleanse is actually like a palate cleanser. So it's actually the food, but I, we jump a little bit from describing going from, cause at this point, I think we can transition. Okay. We can ta stop talking about just the ingredients and then start talking a little bit. People at this point get that. Okay. This whole thing's conceptual. This whole thing has a story. So at this point they've bought into it. We don't like to jump in, you know, before I was, you know, I was like a walk in the, you know, you know, seaside ocean. And it's like, cause like the way we tell the stories, I think for us, we introduce the stories via the ingredients. So that's why we do it early on rather than just, you know, giving them something obscure. It's more like, no, let's start with ingredients because everything we do starts with ingredients. And then as we get towards the end, they're like, okay, you know, we're going to start talking about things that we, you know, more consistently. And so we jump into gratitude. Um, gratitude is, it's kind of like our, it's like the beginning. It's our last, um, the gratitude course is our last savory course. Um, and we call it gratitude because it is a porridge course. Um, people, uh, we, you know, people may or may not know, but we have another restaurant called Porridge and Puffs. So porridge, <laughs> so porridge built this house, we say internally, um, but por this dish is really special because it is something that we talk about at each, we tell each guest is we're really grateful for them. It gives us a chance to like, if we haven't yet to verbally tell them, we're really grateful for you. We're grateful for this village we have and you being a part of this village because it takes a whole village to make this happen. Um, we're grateful for Robin Coda, all of our purveyors, but especially Robin Coda of Coda Farms, um, who is part of a family um, who has a farm that's 100 years old in California. They grow rice in California, which people don't believe. And I'm like, yeah, it's grown here in California. And it is a Japanese um, heirloom variety that was perfected for California environments environments and you know 
Um, and that's really special to us because that's how ingredients, every single one of our ingredients have the story. But Robin Coda is someone really near and special to us um, because not only because of her ingredients, but because of her values and what she stands for and how she inspires me personally. Um, we are also grateful. It reminds me. So, so this dish, I'm grateful for porridge and rice. I'm grateful to Robin. I'm grateful to the diner. And I'm also grateful for our community. Um, what we do takes a whole community. It takes our team, but it is also hearkened to the whole restaurant community. Um, we developed, I developed this dish with Nikki and Carol of Anaka when we collaborated. And it is something that I carry on the menu all the time because it's a reminder that you don't do this alone. You're, you're, you're always learning. You're always collaborating. Um, and it's also something that is eye-opening for me. Like, for a long time, abalone was not served because it wasn't on a safe environmental list. But it just like recently came back that is a, it is environmental and acceptable to eat. So that was really important that we were right there during that transition. And then really learning and doing a deep dive and studying abalone and why it's important. You know, like we use small abalone rather than really big abalones because a life cycle for taste and for environmental reasons, we choose a certain type of abalone, how it's, you know, and, and it's also for us, we use mostly, we use hundred percent wild seafood because it's really important for me how it's obtained and the life it's had, except for the abalone. The abalone is farmed in a very sustainable and thoughtful way because abalone, you can't, you know, we, the reason it became off the list because it just became extinct so we ate too much of it and we wait we waited you know for it to grow but the way it's farm is it's spawned and then thrown back out and see and so they took all the spawning of abalone so it's really so learning it's a reminder for us to like you know always keep your mind open um and then we use the liver again you know use all parts of the animal all parts of the plant and then i hate liver so for me to like you know, kind of take back and be like, Nikki said, you know, you should use a liver. I'm like, eh, I don't know. It's like, that. I don't know if that's going to be too much for our menu. And she's like, I think you're going to love it. And then, you know, you're like, you're looking at this abalone, there's like this tiny little liver. And you're like, how do you even work with that? But learning techniques and figuring that out, like made me take a step back and re remind myself, this is what we do. We learn how to use ingredients. We learn to look at things through a different lens. Um, so this dish is really important to me because it reminds, I'm grateful that I get to cook. I'm grateful that I get to do this. I'm grateful that I have a community. Um, and, you know, it's like, it's just really, there's so much gratitude in what we do. Um, and, you know, I, I exist, I think I am fueled by everyone's energy. And, you know, it's like, if I can't take a moment to really be thankful and feel how privileged I am to wake up every day and do what I love. Um, I'd be really, you know, I'd be really, you know, I'd be really missing the mark here, um, you know. But I know it's a privilege to wake up every day and know exactly what I want to do and work really hard. It's it's such a privilege to be to have something right now that I can be so passionate about and have a place that I can go and do it. Um, yeah. And then the rest of the menu, you know, it's like by this time, everyone's exhausted with all the law. Oh, so, you know, cleanse, cleansing is really important. Again, we re, we bring back the theme of um, all of our stems used during the meal is made into a jam. And then we make that into a granita. So nothing is wasted. We, um, we save all the scraps and then we use it somehow um, in, you know, in the meal. Um, and then, you know, and there's always something seasonal in there and something fun. There's always something, there's everything about our food. There's always some whimsical element to it. Um, sometimes intentional, sometimes that's just my personality coming through. Um, and then, you know, and then we leave with something sweet, um, because that's really important. And then, then, you know, then we go, maybe the next screen. Yes. Let's go to the next screen. Cause I don't see this in menus. Um, and it, this is the acknowledgement page in a book. And here yeah. it is in the menu. We're continuing the narrative. Um, yeah. Here, the uh, guest is made is, aware that it this, does have a team. That's our team. Yeah. That's This is the team. We're just so thankful. Yeah. I mean, it's our last, it's our simple and most efficient way to say, hey, 
thank you for joining us. I mean, it's more for the guests to know, and it's great for the team to remember who worked that day and it's to thank them. Um, and it takes, believe me, this restaurant does not, it, you know, it's not me, it's this team. Um, they do the heavy lifting of working. Um, it's really, it's not easy to think everything, but it's the least physically challenging part of the job is to um is to think of these things the execution is where like the the execution is what makes it really hard and it makes this industry so hard because you try to accomplish all this you know in one seating um and you try to give people all of this and it it's it takes a village and I love just like the menu is the evidence of that. It's the textual evidence of all the stories that you're telling, the lessons you're learning, everything interwoven and in just from something that that all guests can take. It's something tangible they have mm -hmm. along with this incredible experience yeah. of dining there. Um, all of this that you were talking about, it absolutely does come through. And oh my gosh, I can't wait to go to that. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, let's see. Let's take a look. We do have some questions from the audience and you, you've addressed some of them in, in the story. So I just want to make sure um, we'll cover them if there's anything else you wanted to add. So first we talked about um, the ingredients you use sound great and how cool it is that you use seasonal foods. Um, do you, apparent, I'm, I'm thinking this answer is yes. Do you use local suppliers? If so, where can we find these cool and interesting foods? Um, most of our stuff is very, very, very local. Um, mm -hmm. farmer's market is the obvious one. Um, you know, you can definitely go to the farmer's market and find a lot of the ingredients we use. Um, we also, which is something that we, you know, we may or may not forge some stuff or may or may not have specialty, special stuff grown for us. Um, but that's something that's really important to us and it's all done locally um, if we do it. Um, the reason I say if if or if we don't because there's certain health department laws that um, want you to like make sure you use only things that are bought through a system. Um, I don't really agree with that all the time, but I get it because they want to make sure that, you know, there's, there's tracing and they're safe and I really believe in that, but I also believe there's some really thoughtful caring ways to obtain ingredients um, that doesn't always come through the system because the system is also a behemoth and things are missed and things get very homogenized um, and our food is not homogenized. So sometimes things may not be recognized the same way by the system. Um, I love, I love, love markets, um, you know, any kind of market, like, you know, oh, same. Asian, Asian markets, like, you know, I can on any given day, um, that I'm not working, you can find me at a bunch of SGV stores, Hawaii, Shen Fat. Um, you can find me at Super King. Like, like that place amazes me. Um, you can find me at um, Murakai. I was just at Murakai in Tokyo Central today. Um, you can find, you know, so it's like, I, you know, at any given day, you can definitely find me at, you know, California Market or H Mart or any of the local Korean markets near us. Um, those are all wonderful places to hit and just, just, you know, put aside a little budget and be like, I'm going to spend $30 this week on ingredients. I don't know things I'm, you know, may or may not use and I'll find a way to use them and challenge yourself. Um, or a fruit that you've never tasted. Like yeah. usually they're prominently displayed. Like this is what they came, came in yeah. that yeah. week. It's, it's pretty fun times. Yeah. yeah. And the farmer's market is like, um, I think we have the best ingredients in the world. Um, you know, I've, you know, I've been to other Michelin star restaurants and places and I look at their produce I'm like, yeah, that's nice. But mm, our stuff is um, pretty amazing. Um, and where, you know, so yeah, you can get a lot of this stuff. Um, fish is a little harder. We, you know, we have a hard time getting fi good fish ourselves. Um, we use, we tend to use really, we really try to use really good fishmongers. Um, you know, we have Claire from Riviera. Um, we also use Lux. And those are not available to the public. I feel like to the public, it's hard to find good fish. Um, but because like we talk about all the sustainable and this wild stuff. 
but I find it incredibly hard. Well, I also think it's it's a few things. It's incredibly hard because I've I've talked to people I'm like, how come this isn't available to the public? And it's just I think people when you pay forty fifty dollars for a pound or something like we do, you don't want to mess it up, and that's really fair. So you go and eat it at at the restaurant because you know the restaurant eats that you know eats that cost if they mess up on that ingredient. So that's why a lot of stuff isn't available to. No, know, that makes people. sense. Yeah. Like a really good fish at the market is also intimidating and scary. Yeah. So I do, I would rather go to a restaurant. Um, let's see, we have a few more questions. Some of them are pretty fast um, because I think you answered it. I mean, what do you do with leftover food? But do you have leftover food since you're um, using everything? We use everything. Yeah. Mm. I don't think we don't, we don't have a lot of waste, um, to be honest. And then we also have our whole staff to feed um, all the time. Mm. And then we also have porridge and puffs. Um, porridge and puffs gets the, um, you know, the runoffs, the really beautiful runoffs of fenakite. Um, a lot of things we'll use first run of fenakite and then, you know, the pieces that the tea messed up on or someone was half asleep doing um, goes to porridge and puffs, which, you know, it's really great. It prevents a lot. I believe me, it, it prevents a lot of me getting upset because like, you know, if I can be like, oh my God, I can't believe you just lost like $300 worth of blah. You know, because that's the way right. I have to think, right? Because, like, that's, and, and you know, unfortunately, I have to think of it as transactional. But because I can be like, wait, don't worry. You know what? I'll use it for porridge and puffs. So it kind of gives me this out so I'm not so mad. But we end up using everything. Um, we don't, yeah, we don't waste a lot of food, I tell you. That's super sustainable, too. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, another quick question. Where did you go to culinary school? Um, I went to culinary school at um, at CSCA in, in Pasadena before it became the Cardon Bleu and before it became the new school. Um, but, you know, I, I get asked that a lot, but I don't think it really matters. I think mm -hmm. at the end of the day, um, I think it's the sense of it's the curiosity that's really important um, for me. It's like just having a love and tweaking. I think it gives people a baseline. It gives people confidence if they don't know where to start. Um, but for me, it's really, I think it's about just getting in there and learning, um, understanding the whys and the hows. Um, but it's a good question. <laughs> and finally, um, let's see, maybe this is not so fast question. How has being recognized as a restaurant of the year changed your life? If at all? You know, I think I'm still this year. I'm still there's so much to digest this year mm -hmm. that it's like a, it's like an event that I haven't quite digested. I don't. I'll tell you, it, it changed our business a little bit in a not so positive way, but it is a positive way. And I, you know, it's like our waiting list is so long and big. Like we have, like you know, you know, like we had a small waiting list before. It was like you know, six hundred people. We're like, okay, you know, we'll get through this. And then the news hit, and then it was like immediately overnight. It was like ten thousand overnight. Ten thousand. Our waiting list is ten thousand. Now our waiting list is up to fifteen thousand. So every time I'm like, I want to take a break, but every time I look at the waiting list, I'm like, God, we have to get people in. God, we have to get people in. And we only have so many seats. Mm -hmm. So I think for me, it's very stressful. Um, to try to accommodate everyone. And then I think the expect, like, you know, like the expectations higher. So like sometimes when I want to take a risk, I'm like, let's just do this new thing. And I'm like, oh no, I think people are going to get mad. So I kind of like, I'm still fearless, but I'm also like, oh my God, they have this expectation. So it's not always positive, but I'm really grateful to be seen. Um, Bill Addison wrote beautiful i you know i'm gonna give a sh shout out to bill you know to la times writers um jonathan gold first walked into porridge and puffs um eight years ago and you know and wrote about a project that i was working on called porridge and puffs the name is so straightforward because it wasn't supposed to be a restaurant it was supposed to be a simple r and i'm researching porridge i'm researching puffs and then because jonathan gold came in eight times and wrote about it it became a thing and then it became this thing that set the stage for this other thing you know and then fenakite same thing happened um it was just like i was talking to nikki and carol we were collaborating and then you know they were just kind of like you know you need to get in the multi I mean, the multi-course menu, tasting menu, because this is like, you have such a great narrative and the world, you know, we would love it, you know, you to share this with the world. So, you know, we can hang out and do this all day. And, you know, so they were just so inspiring and just kind of pushed me, you know, just nudged me towards that edge that I wanted to get to. And then it happened. It happened so fast. 
like within we were collaborating last September, so a year ago, and then an opportunity came up, Second Home, which is a workspace. Um, it came up and then we, you know, we kind of just took it in 10 days, opened this restaurant and then kept pushing and pushing. And so I don't think I've really absorbed what it means to be a restaurant of the year. And I know a lot of things are happening, but I think I'm just still, do, I'm still in the storm and I'm just working. I'm like, cause I think like every time something new happens, it's like, it continues to be harder and harder every day. It does not get easier. Um, but it's changed in the sense that I think I can put my values out there and people can, this isn't, this part's important to me. I can just say my values fearlessly now. And I'm like, you know what, I'm gonna do this. And then somehow it works. Um, which is, that's the magical part when you do have a little bit of a voice, um, and people around you and people in the, you know, and Bill Addison say, you know, like he came in to Fennekite when it was supposed to be a project. And he, he's been, he's really seen me. He's, his writing is beautiful. The way he captured me, it's beautiful. And he really, he put this place on the map, you know, he put us on the map and I haven't, you know, I'm grateful for that and for him, but I don't really, I don't think I've really absorbed how it's changed, except I feel like we're just busy all the time and I'm dying. Like, it's like this death where you're like, you're like a little duck. You're like, you know, you're like, you, you try to look or like a swan. You're so graceful. You know, you try to pretend or you think you're graceful on, on the top, but at the bottom, you're like, I'm treading water and I'm going to drown any minute, any minute I'm dr I'm going to drown. Well, I mean, I have to say, you you talk about how you were captured and so beautifully, I, just, even just from this conversation, the thing, what you put out there, the stories that you put out there is is already apparent and beautiful. Um, no offense to any writers, because I'm sure it was beautiful, but like, I don't really think it would have taken much to just your point of view, um, your intentionality and the story that you tell, like this was, this was just a beautiful hour, man, and I'm, I'm very sad that it's come to an end. Um, I do want to put a little plug. We had a comment. Um, the library does have a menu collection um, that um, people can view. It's, it's pretty wonderful. And um, cheers to like some kind of archival part of Fenkite or even Porridge and Puffs to be in that menu, menu so people can look back at like the the, these these tangible moments and and experience this again and and have all of this beautiful story come how through. do you do that how do you submit it um i i you know what i i will find out we will talk afterwards mm -hmm. i think it's just a matter of getting it to a librarian and we talk to the people who curate the collection and and there we go <laughs> <laughs> that would be such an honor. I love the library so much. I, so much of me, um, the reason I always say yes to the library, no matter how busy I am, I find time because the library made me who I am today. I mean, you know, as, as I said, I'm a latchkey Gen Xer and I'm an immigrant kid. So everything that I, and I'm very, I'm a, you know, self-didactic. I'm so curious. I spent a lot of time at the library as a kid, pre-internet. You know, I'm really old people. I, you know, I was in, like, I remember microfiche. So, but I just love, um, I love the resources provided to the public. It makes me love, it's like the one thing that when, you know, I get so mad at the United States and I get so mad at, you know, our politics. I'm like, but we have the library. We have library and parks, which are like so amazing. And I just love you, Joanne, Joanne and all you librarians. Like you guys like saved my life, my childhood. Like I just... I just wish this resource will live forever for people and to share and to bring community and to give people opportunities and give people dreams and hopes. It's like the difference that makes our society what it is because it gives people knowledge and it gives them the freedom and the liberation to find this knowledge and, to, you know, to make it their own and to find what they're seeking. So thank you. Oh my gosh, from one library kid to another. Thank yeah. you, Rebecca <laughs> Chu. That was wonderful. <laughs> and thank you everyone too for joining us today. Um, remember, you can check out the library's online calendar at lapl.org slash events for more LA May programs and other programs that we have going on. But Going back to LA Made and what the library can do and the amazing resources and performers that we're able to have, 
Thursday, this Thursday, September 23rd at 4 p.m., LA Made will be joined by astronaut Jose M. Hernandez for a very special presentation where Dr. Hernandez will take us on a journey, not only to space, but also his journey in life. He will talk about the challenges he faced as part of a migrant farm working family and the path he chose to become a member of the 19th class of NASA astronauts. His life story will soon be featured in the upcoming Netflix movie, A Million Miles Away. Don't miss this one live because it will not be recorded. So again, reminder, Thursday, September 23rd at 4 p.m. Until then, we appreciate all your support. The success of LA Made and all of our library programs cannot happen without viewers like you. So thank you. Good night, everyone.